Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Architecting for the End User, Enabling Happy and More Productive End Users. Um, we'd like to take this moment and thank you all for taking the time to join this webinar today. Um, we're just going to give everyone a few more minutes here to join. Looks like we have a few more trickling in. So just kick back and we should get started here in a couple minutes. And as a heads up, the session is being recorded, so you will all have access to the video um, after the webinar is over. So thanks, sit back, and we'll be with you shortly. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. So to get going with introductions, my name is Brandon Lee, and I'm with the marketing team here at FS Logics. And joining me today is Dave Young, solutions architect and product champion. And he's going to be the one that's going to be primarily driving the discussion and walking you through the latest developments and inner workings of FS Logics. Dave, are you there? Ah, there I'm here and a pleasure to be on the call. So with this customer slide, um, all it really does is highlight the fact that we cover the full spectrum of industry verticals, but more importantly, it exemplifies our ability to scale, and that's really a key advantage with FS Logics. So whether you're talking about small, medium businesses or large-scale deployments such as Emory Healthcare, uh, we scale very easily and efficiently. So oh, back one slide here um, are just some customer or some expert uh, testimonials from uh, social media. Please take the time and uh, check us out. Follow us on Twitter at FS Logics and Facebook and LinkedIn and keep up with the latest happenings of what's going on in the industry and with FS Logics. And with that, Dave, you know, I think I'm just going to let you take it away. Not a problem. Thank you more. So um, I want to cover a little bit. We're going to talk about architecting for the end user. So give you guys a little bit of my bio. I've been doing this EUC thing since 1999. Um, and, and that wasn't just on physical. I was an early adopter of virtualization. I'm, a, I'm somewhat proud yet ashamed to say my first VDI project was PC Anywhere running on GSX, okay? Um, and DNS is the broker. So what we were doing is bringing users into the data center because we had an application that didn't behave well and we needed to bring them in for a desktop because it wouldn't work on WinFrame at the time. So we're going to talk about how we can help do that. A little bit about FS Logics. We got four main core products. It's our containers, okay, our Office 365 containers. Um, what that allows us to do is take the contents of Office 365 or any Office product, 
whether it be 2010, 2013, or 2016, and put them into a VHD container so that we don't have to re-download that data every time. We'll talk more about that here in a few minutes, but we also have our profile containers. Very, very simple um, product that makes it like profiles are local, right? Before we started decomposing the desktop, we didn't have profile problems. All we had was local files, and it was great. We'll talk about our Java conflict management tool, which allows us to reduce the risk of Java vulnerabilities in our environment by allowing what we know we can trust. And then last but not least, we'll talk a little bit about application masking. As an old guy that did a lot of thin stall and soft grid, um, those are the previous names for thin app and uh, softricity slash app v. Um, this application masking that we're doing is just a big old easy button. So we'll talk more about that also in today's discussion. But let's talk to, right now about what's going on and what I want you to remember. So as end user computing architects, the problem that we have introduced as architects is we need to solve what I call the mastery of two beasts, right? So on one side, from an IT perspective, I want non-persistence, I want automation, I want redundancy, there's no reason every user has to have their own PC, we want to do pooling and grouping and things like that, right? So that's one side. The other side is if we don't make the experience better, we have not done the end user any favors. I'll give you as an example. If you were driving a Cadillac to work today, or a Lexus or an Infiniti, whatever you want to call it, fancy car to work today, and they said, hey, I'm going to swap out your car. It'll be just the same. It will get you back and forth to work. But I'm going to give you a Yugo. Okay? And if you don't remember the Yugos, um, this is a good Google exercise for you. Check out the Yugos. Okay? And albeit I would have met the technical requirement to provide you transportation to work, I probably would not have met your expectations of what you were expecting. Okay? So if we don't make the performance and the experience better for the end user, we've pretty much failed. Okay? Nobody wants to go down the slow path again, right? We want to make sure that our end users are happy because ultimately it's the end user that keeps us employed. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on. So what's the technical problem of Office 365 in a VDI environment? Well, it gets down to data. So when you look at Office 365, I have one of two choices of what to do with my data. I can leave it out in the cloud and let Microsoft hold it for me. And that is basically called online mode. And online mode is a fancy version of webmail. Okay? Every transaction goes back and forth and it becomes slow. The user doesn't necessarily like it. And it is not a full-fledged mail client. My other opportunity is to take a path of going down an OST path. Well, the first problem that we have with OSTs is, do I want them truly to be in the local image? The answer is probably no, because I want non-persistence in that image. Okay, So then I'm left with uh, leveraging, and we'll use that word politely, leveraging some folder redirection or network shares. And as I leverage that for an OST, it becomes very, very painful. Microsoft does support putting an OST out on a folder redirect, and they have some asterisks, some caveats, and a bunch of warnings. Their basic support statement says, for a light user with light mail in a light environment, you can do this. Okay? They don't determine what light is. Is light 50 messages a day, 50 messages a week, 50 messages a month? You know, you need to keep going, right? They don't determine what that is. And light could be text messages, but no data messages, right? No attachments and things like that. So as we start to look at these things, these are all things that cause our Office 365 opportunity to become very, very difficult. Now, how did we get here? Well, Microsoft's out there selling Office 365, and they're not selling to the engineers and architects. They're in having conversations with business owners, um, the VP, the director, the CFO, right? And, and basically, their selling strategy is something like this. Hey, you're probably out of compliance on your licensing. If you upgrade to Office 365, we'll look the other way, and it's, you know, per user licensing with entitlements, you'll never be out of violation again, you don't have to go through an audit, 
and oh yeah, we'll give you a couple other cool things. We'll give you hosted mail, right? So you can let go of your entire exchange team and not have to worry about having that in-house. We'll give you OneDrive, right? You can have a terabyte of data out in the OneDrive folders and you don't have to have file shares anymore and you can get rid of that team. And the really cool part about it from the financial person's perspective is this is capital versus expense. So if you remember into your business days, capital takes so many years to de depreciate versus expense comes off right away. All right. So these are all very, very compelling business reasons to do things, but not necessarily technically validated reasons to do things. And the deployment goes out to the desktop fairly well, but then when we start looking at VDI and, and Zen app type environments, right, it doesn't go so well because we have all these things that we need to worry about. So let's look at what's going on underneath the covers. And one thing I do want to remind you of, this is something I work very hard on, is I uh, have been working with the Microsoft team to get an endorsement for FS Logix. Um, we had an independent study done by RDS Gurus. They concluded that independent study, published this data, and then out of that, we were lucky enough as FS Logix to bring uh, Benny Trich, Dr. Benny Trich, on board um, to help us build out our German market. Okay, so even Microsoft recommends FS Logix, which is a big deal, um, and it does prove that we are solving problems. The one thing they also talk about here is search. All right, we'll talk more about search in a few minutes, but it is what we consider part of the Microsoft product. So what's the problem, right? The problem is what I call fetch and retrieve. Every time a user logs in, I must build out their desktop from the file share, and then when they log out, I get to put it back, okay? And if I didn't actually touch anything, um, I, I have to rinse and repeat this over and over and over again. If you have a user that logs in four times, they build out their desktop four times. So we're transferring data multiple times and creating a large amount of I.O. on the infrastructure, okay? Unnecessary I.O. An example of that is, let's just say as an end user, I did something really, really crazy and I saved a DVD to my desktop. And if I'm using traditional technologies like roaming profiles, every time I log in, that data has to be downloaded because we have non-persistent machines in our environment. And every time I log out, we have to check to make sure it's the same. And if I open it, you know, and I modify it, it there's just all this repetitive traffic. One of the things that Brandon will send out in the chat window is a link to a study that I got to do with Holsterboro Commune. And, and in short, Holsterboro Commune was running UPM which not, I got nothing against UPM. It was a great technology. It does some pretty cool things. But they replaced UPM in their environment with FS Logics profiles and went from, with, for 3,400 users, went from 31,000 IOPS down to 2,500. And when we think about that massive increase or truly massive decrease in I.O., that means that I can now start to put I.O to the appropriate uses, right? I don't need I.O. just to move files around. I need I.O. so that when I launch my desktop, I have as much I.O. available to build out the desktop as possible. So as we start to look at that, you know, there's one opportunity is our Office 365 container, right? Um, what we do is we allow that container to make the operating system believe that the OST data is local. Okay, we talk to it at a block level versus a file level. So that gives us a different opportunity in how we work with that. We were first to market with this, right? Um, it is real-time performance, right? I can use it in published desktops, on Citrix, um, on, on um, Azure. You know, it doesn't matter to, to me where it is as long as the operating system has a Windows backend. Um, for Office 365, we support 2010, 2013, 2016, and we support Windows 7 and higher for multi-user search, and Windows 2012 and higher for, excuse me, let me back up. For Windows 7 and higher, it's single-user search, single-user mode, and for 2012 and higher, it is multi-user, or excuse me, yeah, multi-user mode. And the biggest difference there is on single-user mode, we're intercepting the entire search database. On multi-user mode, we only um, intercept 
the user's appropriate area. It's a little different approach. And that allows us to capture those search results for things like Outlook, okay? Um, and then the one-off to that is 2008 for single user mode is supported also. And that is the scenario is I'm using 2008 licensing to deploy a 2008 desktop to an end user. So it gives us a lot of different options to be able to optimize our Exchange or our Google Mail, whatever it is, our Office 365 environments by putting that data into an OST. So a little bit of what's going on and, and how do we see the improvements. So if we take the number of file opens per second per user, it's roughly two file opens, or excuse me, one file open every two seconds per user. So if we calculate that out, it comes out to be like 0.5 file opens per second. You multiply that times 1,000 users, and you're at 500 file opens. And if you remember back to your designing a file share days, okay, um, before we all had 100,000 IOPS available to us for nothing almost, what that meant is a very costly operation. Okay, Each file open, if you design it to its optimum performance, is you're going to design it so that you no longer have a queue greater than two, and you would need a lot of CPUs to support that. Okay, when you beat out all the math, right? So the common, the, the magical formula is memory and CPU beats disk, right? And as you calculate that all out, you got to make sure you have enough memory and CPU to keep the disk fed. And file opens are a very expensive operation. And what happens is, is it, it can only support so many file opens at a time. So if I'm the fifth user in a two-proc machine, right, I have to wait until those other two transactions are done before my file gets open. And that's what causes great slowdowns, especially when we're looking at OSTs. Okay? So that's the number one thing that we're solving. With FS Logics, we only do a file open per user when they launch the VHD, when they attach to it, basically on login. So throughout the day, you'd be looking at like four file opens per minute, right? Um, technically, a thousand right in the morning file opens and a thousand right at the evening file closes. But when you average that out, it becomes to be like four file opens per minute. So it really changes what we're doing in that communication with the actual data. And this is what gives us our speed, right? So what are we doing? Right? In a nutshell, what we have is an intercept to see users, percent username, app data local, Microsoft Outlook. And we're taking that folder and we're putting it into the FS Logix container. Okay? And I'm going to show you some screenshots of things of, of what we're doing so you can wrap your head around it. But all we're doing is we're mounting that folder as a VHD. And this isn't anything really technologically new. This has been going on for a while. Um, Microsoft created these many, many years ago. At first, we were just using them to like intercept a folder that had grown too big for the C drive, right? And we put it on another drive, and the operating system didn't really know what was going on, right? Well, now this has evolved into the VHD realm, okay? So no longer do we have to have a physical disk. We can actually do it to a virtual disk. And what that gives us the capability to do is put those VHDs out into a central file share, and when the user logs in, we mount that VHD, the user talks to it like it was local, and then when they're done, we dismount the VHD, and it sits there waiting for them to come into the next machine. And that's what gives us, ultimately, our speed and what we're doing. So by capturing that data with our filter driver and making it go to the VHD, yet not letting the system know that it's going somewhere different, allows us to have a functioning environment. So we support several things, OST, Search, OneDrive, um, Link, Global Address Book, all sorts of different things that are all part of the Office 365 environment and container. So let's talk a little bit. We've talked about what the issue is, right? We've talked about what the options are. Let's talk about what usually happens, right? So what usually happens, I get two types of calls from customers. I get architects that heard me talking today that called me in a week and say, hey, I am uh, planning out our deployment. I'd like to make sure that we have everything covered, and we'd like to pull you into our process. And those guys usually and gals usually proceed through a path, and they get us into their environment, and they have success. The other thing I have, and this is what you want to avoid, is the person that doesn't know 
okay, hasn't heard of us, they go out and deploy Office 365, attempt folder redirection. It worked well for their personal test, and then when they added their IT buddies, it worked it well. And then they start rolling it out. And roughly at about 150 users is when things go sideways. And we get what we call the panic call. Okay, um, They are about to get in trouble. People are complaining. Companies considering not going down Office 365 path. Um, there's a whole lot of angst in the environment. Okay. Now the good news is, even when there's a whole lot of angst in the environment, we can still help. Okay. So if you're like Dave, you're talking about me, give us a call. We can help you out. Right. Um, in less than an hour, we can get the software set up in your environment, get it configured, so that you can start moving forward. Okay. You're going to find it's a pretty darn simple installation and configuration. Okay. And how do you avoid this? Uh, engage early with us. Okay. Um, Get this in your environment. Test it so that as you move down this path, you have some options. All right. So a little bit of the impact. I just want to go over this real quick. This is a quick little study I did. I had a mailbox that downloaded 318 megs of data, which roughly took about six minutes, WAN and CPU being a variable factor. Without FSLogix in the picture, if I'm doing a local OST, that's a rinse and repeat. Every time I log in, I have to go get the entire mailbox. At 318 meg, that's not a big deal. How many people can honestly raise their hand and say I have a 318 meg mailbox? It's usually like in the gig realm, right? And if you look at what the CPU was doing in that realm, it was about 35%. Okay? And then with FSLogix involved, intercepting that local path, right? Yeah, I downloaded it. Still 318 meg that I downloaded. It took the same six minutes, right? But the second login, I only had to get the deltas, right? Which was a very small amount of data. took 30 seconds. The third login, the deltas once again, was 30 seconds. So my CPU processing dramatically changed, right? Those subsequent logins, N plus 1, are now at 3% versus 35%. So, so that gives us a much streamlined or much more improved performance scenario for the users in that environment. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. So if you're not familiar, just in case, um, this is just a term Dave knows. I looked it up, and, and it's basically talking about what nobody wants to talk about. right? So the elephant in the room is IT people went a while back and decided that search being turned on in a VDI, RDSH, ZenApp environment was a bad thing. So a good friend of mine, Jack McMichaels over at VMware, wrote the VMware optimization tool, right? And it went through and shut off a whole lot of stuff, like search. And, and not to just poke fun at VMware, um, another guy that's been known in the industry, Brian Madden, wrote the same thing, okay? And, and because that was the only option that we had at the time. If we left search on, it ate up a ton of CPU and meant we didn't get the density that we were looking for. So search became normal to shut off. Now, let's think about, you know, let's go back to that Yugo discussion, right? Um, if I am the end user and I think I'm getting the Cadillac and a Yugo is what gets delivered to me, wouldn't you think I'd be mad? You know, no heat, um, you know, you hand roll down the windows, right? Now I'm not very happy about my experience, and I'm going to complain, okay? So as we think about what we're doing for the end user, shutting off search, I'll be honest, was a BS answer. We should have never done that. We should have figured out something to do different. Well, FS Logix has figured out something different to do, and what we have done is we have enhanced what we're doing for search. So right now, if you run online search with an app, the search index is disabled. Whoops, sorry, hit two buttons. Sorry about that. There's no cache. It's what's called instant build, which is very unpredictable, both on the network and the CPU, and it impacts our environment. Okay? I'm going to show you the next slide here where you can see I conducted the search, and I just typed the word diamonds. Okay? If you look at the CPU and network over there, it is continuously asking the Office 365 servers, did you find anything with the word diamonds in it? Did you find it? Did you find it? Did you find it? Kind of like a little kid on a road trip, right? Before we had um, TVs and cars and, and iPads and such, right? 
So it continuously talks to those servers and eats up a large amount of CPU. If you look at what's going on when we've inserted FS Logic, what we do is, yeah, we conduct that initial search index. Okay, it's a price you got to pay. You can't get around it. It has to be conducted. But what we do is we allow us to persist that to the user. Right? We are independent of any profile solution. You don't have to have our profile solution. You could have whatever you want. We don't care. It's independent of us. Um, but what we do is we give you a predictable user environment. Right? What's going on? Right? reduction in CPU utilization. And we can extend the performance on our infrastructure because now I can get greater density, right? Less network traffic. And if you look at the statistics here, you'll see that as I type the three words, diamonds are forever, you'll see over there on the right of the CPU, I have three little spikes, diamonds, and then are, and then forever. And then it QSs, right? It doesn't continue to eat up a large amount of CPU. Right? It goes quiet and says, hey, there was something there, there wasn't something there. Right? And it allows us to have that index be portable from desktop to desktop, server to server, without the user having to waste CPU cycles to rebuild that. Pretty cool, pretty simple. I call that liberation of the end user. Right? Uh, we took and oppressed them by taking away search. And now they can have it back without question. Next piece I want to talk about is, is what's going on underneath the covers with us. Okay? So here you can see that I have done a list of redirects, and you can see that I have roughly four. I'm intercepting C users, percent user name, demo user two, right? Um, and I'm putting that into volume three for the profile. And then I took the Outlook stuff, and I'm putting it into volume four under ODFC. And I've got the OneDrive stuff, and it's going into volume four under ODFC. And I've got my uh, Microsoft uh, second folder for OneDrive, and it's going into a different uh, folder under OneDrive on volume four. And ultimately, what we've done is we've intercepted these folders, and we're pushing them into VHD. Okay? Now, a very important thing to remember, notice that for demo user two, that directory just shows up as a directory. Okay? Now, this is a, what I call the you know, comparing those who know in the industry what they're doing and those who don't, okay? So because ours shows up as just in a directory, what that gives us the capability, and this is important for profiles, is to interact with a local system, okay? So underlying deep in the technologies is the little thing on disk, add, change, delete notifications. Add, change, delete notifications are not intended to go from volume to volume, which means if I'm doing something like, oh, OneDrive in a VHD, okay, and it's a traditional junction, and I delete something, the OneDrive sync client never knows that, hey, Dave deleted his resume or changed his resume. I should replicate that, okay? So with us, we watch both sides of that junction so that we can take those types of things and process them to the sync client. So in our scenario with a mounted VHD, you delete your resume, and that notification gets heard by us. We tell the local disk, hey, there's a delete notification over here. You might want to know about it. And that triggers the OneDrive sync client to say, hey, replicate this. Okay? Or deleting just a simple document out of my profile. Hey, throw that into the recycle bin. Okay? And if you don't believe me on how important this is, um, another little Google search fun thing that we'll do is mount a VHD on your machine and intercept a folder with it and look at the junction, see it, right? Then put a piece of data in that, in that directory and delete it and see if it shows up in the recycle bin. And a lot of the other, you know, the, um, other solutions out there won't protect that document at that level. And I don't know about you, but I think I spent the last 20 something years of my career teaching people to use the recycle bin. We do not want to take that away from them. We want them to use the recycle bin so they don't have to call IT to get a file restored. So let's uh, go on a little bit further into what we're doing. So here we have the Outlook folder, okay? And you'll see that we're intercepting app data local Microsoft. That Outlook folder is actually going into that VHD, okay? Um, this particular VHD is a gig, right? But from an FS Logics perspective, if it's a VHD, it could be up to two terabytes. If it's a VHDX, it could be up to 64 terabytes. Okay, um, a lot of data that could be in that data. Now, in this particular little snapshot, it is local, 
right? I've got it all local, but that would be out in a file share that you would be accessing from the environment. And all we do is manage that communications path between what the machine thinks is C users, percent username, app data, local Microsoft Outlook, and the VHD. And that becomes a very transparent activity. So configuration, I said it was pretty simple, right? Um, technically, to deploy us, you need two keys. You need the enabled key to turn us on, and you need the VHD locations key. You can see here I have a server one slash share. That'd be whatever your SIFs, NTFS, NFS. Uh, I've even got a customer doing um, Novell. Uh, whatever file share that that client can access to write a file into is what you would point it at. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in your, in your environment. And then install the software and you're done. I want to show you Office 365 Outlook running. Um, important part on this little demo is notice that I have 8,500 messages in my inbox, okay? But also notice that I need a password. I have not been in communication with the online servers, yet everything is cached locally. So that gives us that local look and feel, local data, so that as I go through emails, I can pull them up from cache versus having to go out to the servers to get them again. Um, the last thing I want to show you is, bear with me as this advances, there we go, there's search, this is me, or excuse me, this is my configuration, you can see it's set to the default path, right, didn't change anything, didn't have to do anything special, it just picks this up as if it's a local path, okay. Next thing I wanted to show you is a little bit about what's going on in search. So you can see it just behaves as normal. It says zero items left, it went through, it indexed all those items, and it now has a local cache copy of the search index so that you know when I actually do a search, it comes up and finds data quickly without me having to wait for it to go out to the, the web to find that data. Next thing I want to talk to, we talked about the containers. Profile containers are very similar to Office 365 containers. We just change what we're doing. Um, instead of going down to App Data Local Microsoft Outlook, we go to C users percent username. Okay? Um, it allows us to persist that user's profile and reconnect it to whatever machine that they're logging into. And it behaves as if it's local, right? So instead of having to fetch and retrieve a whole bunch of data to build out the user's environment, all we're doing is intercepting a folder, mounting that VHD, that is measured in milliseconds, not seconds, and that is a very, very quick solution to performance problems around profiles, okay? It gives us the opportunity to eliminate folder redirection so that we can reduce the amount of I.O. and we don't have to rewrite things over and over and over again. And technically all we're doing is we're intercepting the user's profile folder and putting it into the VHD, okay? And this just behaves as if it's local, leaves nothing behind. Now for those of you that are ZenApp and PVS write cache lovers, which I am a big fan of, um, one of the problems with uh, users logging into a machine is that starts to fill up your write cache, okay? With FS Logics turned on in your environment, that data is never logically written to the C drive, so it never goes to your write cache, and the whole thing is just avoided. I had a guy um, out of Omaha that implemented this technology. He estimated he is spending about 1.25 hours a day managing write cache, you know, bleeding users off machines, rebooting servers, et cetera, et cetera, to zero. Now, the weird part about this whole story is he called me and he said, thanks, we're having a baby. I was like, huh? And apparently, because he hadn't, didn't have to spend an hour every night um, dealing with PVS write cache, he now has a little one on the way. So maybe it made his life a little bit better. Uh, I hope he doesn't want money to help put that child through school because it's not my fault. I just helped make his world a little better. So, uh, you know, it's, it's changing what we do in the environment. It's giving you better solutions so that you don't have to deal with some of those issues. Last thing I want to talk about is how do we reduce image management problems, okay? So with FS Logics, we believe that you can get down to a single image, okay? Now this doesn't take into account, this is all technology, it doesn't take into account politics and things like that. So what we encourage and, be, and believe in is install the application into the base image, 
right? And then reveal the application to the appropriate user. Okay, so the scenario I'm going to talk about is having Office 2010, 2013, 2016 all installed on the same image, okay, and spinning up all those machines so that when a user logs in, they get the appropriate application at the appropriate time. So a quick little demo of this, you can see I have a machine with Office 2016 installed, and I am going to create a rule set for Office 2016. So I highlighted it, I'm going to hit the scan button, and once we do that, what's going to happen is it's going to create a set of rules, okay? So those rules are what does it take to make Office disappear? So it comes up and it creates a whole bunch of different things. It says hide this, hide that, et cetera, et cetera. You can see here I have 333 rules. When I apply this into test or production, um, in this scenario I'm gonna apply it to test, what happens if you look over there on the left, you'll see there's no more Office 2016. Okay, it totally removes it from the system. So now what I can do is I can go in and assign who can see the application. So I hide it from everyone, and then I say, you know what, only the users that are in Office 2016 get to see this application, right? Only the users that are in Office 2010 get to see Office 2010. Only the users that are in Adobe Pro group get to see Adobe Pro. Yet if I'm not in that group, I don't have to worry about having violated my licensing or whatever um, may be an issue in that scenario. So it gives us the ability to give the appropriate application to the appropriate user at the appropriate time. And one of the questions I get asked, I'm going to go ahead and, and intercept this question now because I know somebody's going to ask is, well, do you work with app layering? And the short of the answer is yes. What we believe in and what we see a lot of customers doing is creating suites of layers, okay? So I've got my Office productivity suite that's got Office 2010, 2013, 2016. Maybe it's got a little word perfect in it. It's got open office in it, et cetera, et cetera. I've got all my office tools in that layer. And then I go through with FS Logics and create a mask. So now I deploy the whole Office productivity suite to all users, okay, as a layer but only the appropriate group gets to see the appropriate application. So it reduces me from having, in that scenario, I think I counted eight applications or eight layers down to one layer, and then I divvy up that layer to the appropriate users. So it gives us that flexibility to simplify those environments yet one more time. The last thing I want to cover is a cool little tool, um, Java. So for those on the phone, if you don't know or you are in denial of a Java problem in your environment, um, we've got a cool tool for you. So the scenario with Java is, um, I'll, I'll just give you a quick scenario. Finance, three years ago, built a whatever finance builds application, and it was built on Java 1.6. Okay, And HR deployed two years ago, whatever HR deploys as an application, and it was built on Java 1.7. And manufacturing deployed a project this year to redo the entire manufacturing suite, and it's on 1.8. Well, who do I give Java, what, what version do I go with? Do I make everybody upgrade to 1.8? If so, you're a business killer, because you know, we spent a million dollars on that finance application, a million dollars on the HR application. We're going to have to go do that again. And maybe it's not a million dollars. Maybe it's only $100,000, right? But we're going to waste a lot of money on a perfectly good application to retool it, okay? With our Java redirect tool, what this allows us to do is to allow what we know we can trust, okay? So inside the environment, I know I can allow Java 1.6 to the finance application. And I know I can allow Java 1.7 to the HR. And I can allow 1.8 and higher to everything else. Okay, And here soon I'm going to have to put in a rule for 1.8 to the manufacturing application because 1.9 is going to come out. So it gives me the ability to control what version of Java can execute what applications or URLs. So say you're like the great state of Texas and they have this program it's an entitlements verification program. So when you come in for your entitlements, they have to verify that you're eligible not collecting entitlements from somewhere else. And they literally go to every county's web page, okay, and we're just going to say there's 100 counties in Texas. I don't know how many there are for sure, 
but they go to every county's web page, which was written on a different version of Java, and they have to log in and verify that I'm not receiving entitlements somewhere else, right? So when we think about that, what do I need? If they have 100 machines uh, or 100 different counties, I need 100 different machines or I need some kind of weird Java solution. What we allow is we put in the URL, we can very, get very, very specific on it and say allow this one web page to run under Java 1.1 and this other web page to run under Java 1.8, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a quick little example of the rules. You can see I have app one, app two. I have specified which version of Java I want them to be able to utilize. And I can do the same thing on a URL. Very, very simple. If it takes you more than five to six minutes to implement this, um, you're doing it the wrong way. Call us for help. It is, it is really, really simple to do. And that gives us the ability to not have to worry about what version of Java is the default version and what application is going to work where. Last thing I want to talk to you about is just a quick use case, um, very interesting study. This is one of our early adopters, Neovia Logistics. Um, they were part of uh, Caterpillar and got spun off, and they basically run the logistics for Caterpillar. Um, they had a huge problem, right? They were migrating from Notes to Office 365. Profiles were bloated. Uh, it just logins were long, a lot of calls to the help desk because things weren't going well. They had a ton of siloed applications because, you know, everybody's got their own little plug-in for Outlook or SharePoint, et cetera, et cetera. And, and life was just really, really tough for them. And they came to us, and they looked at what we had. They liked what we had. And they decided that they were going to implement what we had. Now, these numbers that you see are their numbers. They're not our numbers. They're their numbers. But they, you know, eliminated user profile corruption. That was huge, right? If you think about how many hours you spend a day dealing with profile corruption um, because of that fetch and retrieving technology, right, versus block level writing, uh, it may be that may be your selling point right there, right? Um, productivity gains for their company, 125,000 man hours. I mean, that, that's huge. That's time not waiting for Outlook to get a message. Time not waiting to find a message because search wasn't working, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Login pro productivity gains, their logins, if I remember correctly, when we met them, were about a minute and 30 seconds on norm, sometimes as high as five minutes. Okay, And because we were doing folder intercept versus writing of data over and over again, um, that got down to sub-15 seconds. Okay, um, They expect to shrink their VDI environment by 25%. Okay. Um, that's roughly 50 servers, which is huge when you think about the hardware tax, the VMware tax, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was huge for them. And they went from 12 to 2 staff managing their 5,000 end users. So some very significant um, numbers from their perspective, right? Um, and users are actually happier. One of the guys, um, kind of funny part of the story, um, got a case of uh, rum from one of their end users because the lady was so happy she could actually get her job done without having to put in overtime. She sent this particular person, who was not the person responsible for all the changes, but sent this particular person a case of rum to thank them because she felt very empowered to be able to get her job done at that point. So some cool stuff there. Last thing I want to cover with you is what does it take to get this rolling, right? Well, for starters, drop us a note at sales at fslogics.com and tell us you're interested in evaluating our software. You can even go to our web page. I'm sure Brandon's going to put the link out there and register. Now drop us a note just in case you want to make it a little easier. What you need, you need a test machine and you need a file share. Okay, and you need roughly 20 minutes free where we can go through the configuration with you, okay, and a little bit of training. Generally, we block this out in an hour because sometimes you don't have everything ready. Every once in a while, we like to tell funny IT stories, so we block out an hour. But it is literally 20 minutes of work to get this done. And then you can go off to testing. Our uh, test proof of concept license is fully uninhibited, right? You get to do everything with it. It lasts for 30 days. If you decide you like it and you want to push it out into production, the upgrade is very simple. You add a new license key. Okay, um, So it's a pretty simple rollout, and it, it just you know, changes things that are going on in IT. I'm going to pause. That's the end of my technical presentation. 
I wanted to open up to Brandon to see if there were any questions, and I will address those as we can. Yeah, guys. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to obviously uh, raise your hand and ask whatever um, you know is on your mind. Uh, I think one thing, though, Dave, for clarification purposes, our Office 365 containers, um, I saw that I think it was still named Office 365 container for Citrix. But to clarify, does it work only on Citrix? It works on any platform. I was being nice because Citrix had invited me to this meeting. Um, but yes, it will work on any platform. It'll even work on a non-virtualized platform. So let's just say for some reason you've got a weird use case like one of my hotels where they had physical machines, but users roamed around the hotel from machine to machine and needed to be able to gain access to their profile and mail. They deployed this on a physical realm too. So we are not virtual specific. We are Windows specific. Windows 7 and higher. Windows 2008 and higher. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, that was that was some good clarification on uh, on that point. Um, I think getting to OneDrive with um, what you were going over earlier and pers persisting OneDrive across the uh, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there, you guys. <laughs> no worries. Um, I think one of the things you might have been asking, and you can reword it after you get your train of thought, um, what can we do for OneDrive, right? So if I'm logged into a VDI or RDSH slash Zen app server, right, I can cache that data, all right? Now, I want to be very clear. We're not doing any byte deduplication. We're not doing it. We don't do anything like that. We're just a cheap old disk, if you want to think of it that way. But what we do allow is we allow you to go from machine login to machine login and that data to be instantaneously, and if you didn't hear me, I was snapping my fingers, instantaneously reconnected to that user's desktop. So now, instead of having to go out and re-pull data or wait for it to pull across the WAN link, it is there. It is cached, I utilize it, I do things, I hit save, and in the background, the OneDrive sync client says, hey, let me replicate this out to the cloud, and off it goes. So very, very transparent to what the end user is doing, but gives them that flexibility of having that local cache. Excellent. So uh, here's a good question. So where are the VHDs stored? If the VHD is on a network share, how does that decrease I.O. versus just redirecting? Great question, and it really goes back to that file versus block level conversation. Okay. So let's just take a, a typical PowerPoint. This PowerPoint I gave today, I think it was 18 meg. Not very big. I've got some PowerPoints, you can ask Brandon, that are like 200 meg, all right? Because it got some videos in them and things like that. So let's use that 200 meg PowerPoint for an example. If I open that up in a file share type environment, what happens is it copies the entire file to local cache, I do whatever I need to, and it posts the entire file back to the share, okay? With FS Logics, we open it, and at the beginning, all you have is slide one, right? So it might be a very small amount of data that we need to read, okay? Maybe a half a meg out of 200 meg. So we read that small amount of data. And if I don't make any changes, nothing gets written back to disk. If I change the date, the only thing that gets written back to disk are the blocks that contain the data for the date in that scenario. Right? When I move to the next slide, yes, I'm going to stream the data from the next slide, but I don't have to repost that every time I open and close that file. So reading at that block level is what gives us a lot less I.O., reducing the fact that every time a user logs into a machine, I have to copy data. We'll use a DVD on the user's desktop as an example. So if I have a DVD on the user's desktop and they go and access that. I have to determine, you know, when do I transfer that data, right? So four gig, large amount, if I'm reading that, it's, it's literally writing that stuff to cache every time I launch that DVD. With us, it only reads the actual pieces and components that I'm utilizing at the moment, okay? So much different on the I.O. framework. The other scenario I'll give to you, if, if you think back to when we were dealing with physical PCs, the average physical PC has one spinning disk in it running about 160 IOPS. 
And that begs to ask why, if you go out and search, and the minimum number of IOPS required for VDI, it's around 250. When a physical PC has 160, why in a VDI realm is it 250? Well, the reason is, is we're doing things like spinning up new machines, right? Copying user data, et cetera, et cetera. And all these things take I.O. from the environment. And, and every time I copy a file, it's just more and more I.O. that I have to move around within the environment. So hopefully that clarifies it. Um, you know, if, if you're truly doing a net new file and you save it, and let's say it was that DVD or, excuse me, that uh, PowerPoint that's 100 meg, you will write 100 meg, but it won't be all at one time. It'll be slowly as you create the new blocks of data. So a little bit different on how the technology works, basically taking a step back roughly 15 years previous. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I think that makes, I think that clarified, uh, clarified everything. And um, with that, I don't think... Uh, We'll give everybody a chance, but I don't think there are any more questions here, Dave. And um, I think we're just going to let everybody take. Whoop. Okay, one more here. If we have multiple data centers with ZenApp where users log into both environments, do you recommend replicating the VHDs between sites? This is a great question, and there are a lot of answers to this question. Okay, so there's two factors: latency and bandwidth okay, that we need to take into consideration. And I, I don't have a recommendation either way. You need to look at your environment to figure out what you want to do. Generally, I follow the recommendation of keep the user as close to the data as possible. Okay? So as we start to look at that, if I, if I replicate it, yes, I got data in two places. There's some concerns there, right? But you know, hey, it'll be fast if the user is closest to it. Or if I access it remotely, there is some impact there. So we do have customers that do this, okay? They do it across the pond um, from the UK to New York, and it works just fine for them, okay? Um, they're running, I don't remember exactly what their latency is, but it works fine for them. For a DR type scenario, they would not run this in a production realm. I have other customers that have, you know, basically like geo clusters going on, and they'll go from one metropolitan area data center to another, you know, their same metropolitan area data center, and they're running 10 to 15 milliseconds of latency, and they've got plenty of bandwidth, okay? So the things that you need to think about is how much bandwidth, how much latency. General rule of thumb, okay, if you got at least 100 megs of bandwidth and sub 20 milliseconds of latency, you're okay. Okay, general rule of thumb. There are a lot of variables in there. If you say you're going to do that with 20 million users, um, eh, that's not going to be good. Four to 5,000 users, you'll be fine. So things to look at, promise me you'll go out and, and test this in your environment because there are so many variables that you need to be aware of, but you can run this from one data center as the access point to another data center that is the data point. So you can do that, or you can choose to replicate them. It's up to you what fits your scenario. Excellent. And with that now, uh, I think we are going to finally let everybody go early. Um, if you do have any more questions, of course, yeah, feel free to reach out to sales at fslogics.com. But once again, we thank you all for taking the time to join us today, and we hope you all have a great rest of the afternoon and evening wherever you are in the world, and thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Cheers.